Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to this session. My name is Maurício Rezende. I'm a professor at Universidade Estadual do Mato Grosso do Sul, and I will be the moderator of this panel on behalf of Abralim. I would like to thank Abralim's Syntax Committee for the invitation to <clears throat> moderate this panel, which is part of Abralim Ao Vivo's activities, Linguists Online. I would also like to thank Professor Amir Preminger and Professor Howard Lesnick for their kindness and availability in participating of this panel. Finally, I would like to thank our audience for being here and remind them that questions and comments can be sent by the chat during the talk. So uh, today we are going to have the conference, The Building Blocks of Language by Professor Preminger, followed by a debate by Professor Lesnick. But please send comments and questions if you like. Omer Preminger is a professor at University of Maryland, and he is particularly interested in syntax and morphology. He is the author of a great number of papers and book chapters, and some of his research topics are argument predicate agreement, ergativity, nominal case, and head movement. Thank you, Professor Preminger. The microphone and attention is all yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, your attention and for joining today. Um, I, uh, I hope you can hear me. If you can't, I guess Mauricio will uh, chat me or something. Um, so let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah. So uh, like I said, the title, uh, like what you heard from Mauricio, the title of the talk is The Building Blocks of Language. Um, and as background, I want to start from the sign. So uh, at the center of much of the 20th century discussion of language, one finds the sign that is the relation between uh, the concept or the meaning that we might associate with an object like this and the form that in English we express as table, in Spanish as mesa, in Hebrew as shulchan, and so on and so forth. Um, much has been made especially in the first half of the 20th century about the often arbitrary nature of the relation between the meaning of a sign and its form. And um, you could sort of tell that that arbitrariness is in an important sense the default because we have special names for uh, the phenomena where that arbitrariness doesn't hold. So we have uh, expression, uh, concepts like onomatopoeia or iconicity for the cases uh, comparatively rare that uh, the arbitrariness breaks down. So as you might've seen in the abstract to this talk, um, I refer to the quote from Humboldt that uh, language makes infinite use of finite means. And the talk will uh, in a large part be zooming in on these finite means. And one thing that language certainly seems to have finitely many of, so something that language doesn't have an infinite number of, is arbitrary non-decomposable signs. So we might have very many, we might have tens of thousands of these in a given language, depending on how you count and which language, something that we'll get to uh, later on. But however large the number is at any given time in a speaker's uh, cognitive state, there are finitely many of these. It's worth noting that it's not at all clear that humans are the only animal that can make use of arbitrary science. Um, there's work uh, going back 40 years now about the question of whether uh, the alarm calls used by vervet monkeys are or are not arbitrary signs. Um, the issue is not as simple as obviously yes or obviously no, but I, I would say it's definitely potentially the case that there are non-human uh, organisms that make use of arbitrary signs. So given that, and given, so let's say, let's assume that uh, arbitrary signs are not unique to humans. Natural language is unique to humans. 
So this invites the inference that the secret sauce, so to speak, the thing that makes human language what it is, is the combinatorics. That is what's special about human language is the infinite use. And what I wanna do next is draw a connection between that idea and Chomsky's uh, more recent hypothesis uh, known by the name as the strong, of the strong minimalist thesis. I'll explain uh, what I take the content of that hypothesis to be in a moment. So the strong minimalist thesis that uh, has been found in Chomsky's writing going back 25 years now is that the only linguistically proprietary cognitive capacity is merge which is the ability to recursively assemble objects into hierarchical structures of the sort you see here. That is to say, the only cognitive capacity that is special to language and not domain general to use a term from an earlier stage of cognitive science is this combinatoric recursive ability. That entails that everything beyond this capacity has to be, like I said, more general than, uh, than pertaining to language proper. Um, and instead would have to rely on properties of other cognitive systems and Chomsky lists among these uh, motor systems, perceptual systems, uh, systems of non-linguistic thought. Plus it could also rely on let's say general principles of computation. But all of these would have to be of a purview that is not specific to the human capacity for language, which, according to this hypothesis, is sort of animated by merge. So in today's talk, I want to give you an argument against the strong minimalist thesis based on the nature of the atoms involved in linguistic computation. That is based on the nature of what it is that's sitting at the bottom of these hierarchical structures. Specifically, I wanna show you a, an argument that the atoms themselves are linguistically proprietary. That is to say, they are unlike anything that could have existed outside a linguistic system. In particular, they're nothing like the arbitrary signs that one might find outside of uh, human language. So if the atoms of linguistic computation are themselves cognitively special, that is they don't resemble anything that one finds in other cognitive domains, that entails that merge is then not the only linguistically proprietary cognitive capacity, which would then be a falsification of the strong minimalist thesis. So that's going to be the structure of today's talk. And here's a snapshot of the actual claim I'm going to try to support. I'm going to uh, try to support the claim that syntactic terminals, the things we're used to drawing on the bottom of the syntactic tree, um, don't themselves have forms or have meanings in any uh, rigorous formal sense of the term. Instead, they're fully abstract. They come to be associated with forms via many to one rules. So for instance, a rule mapping these two terminals together onto this unit of form or a unit mapping these two units together onto a unit of form. And they come to be associated with meaning via many to one rules from syntactic terminals to listed meanings. So a many to one rule say, associating these two terminals with a single meaning and a, a different rule associating these two with a given meaning and so forth. Of course, a special subcase of many to one mappings is the case where many happens to equal one. So as you see here there is a form mapping rule. I hope this is not clipped off by the right hand uh, side of the screen. Um, actually, I can temporarily make sure it's not. Let me see if I can do that. Um, there is a rule here that maps just this terminal onto a form. And there is a rule here that maps just this terminal onto a unit of meaning, but that's in some deep architectural sense, an accident. That is the architecture of the system involves many to one rules, except it doesn't 
directly say that many has to be more than one. Ah, yes, I could have used this, which is just a larger version of the same diagram, which you will see uh, several times more before we're done. Okay. So this will have a couple of other consequences, which I think are interesting for the practicing linguist, even for practicing linguists that aren't syntacticians, or even mainly for practicing linguists that aren't syntacticians. If everything that I've said so far, well, I've just given you the, the highlights of what I'm going to say. If all of that turns out to be correct, then strictly speaking, questions like what does the word blah mean or what does the morpheme blah mean? And questions like how do speakers of this particular language pronounce the meaning M are not coherent questions. I'll, I'll say that again, they're not coherent questions because words and morphemes aren't interpreted and meanings aren't pronounced. Instead, certain syntactic structures are pronounced in a certain way and certain syntactic structures are also interpreted in a certain way. And it's possible, right? Nothing tells you that it's categorically going to be the case that there will never be mappings of this sort where a single terminal happens to get mapped all by itself onto a form and onto a meaning. But you can't presuppose that that's going to be the case before doing some analysis. And so absent that analysis, questions like these end up not being uh, ontologically coherent. Okay, so let's now uh, begin the road towards substantiating these claims that I've given you, um, which depending on your background in morphology or in syntax may seem like very bold claims or may seem like very old uh, familiar claims. Um, I'm trying to pitch this talk to a mixed audience. So if some of this is familiar to you, uh, I hope that by the time we'll done, we're done, you will have seen some unfamiliar stuff. Um, in fact, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that that's the case. Um, so the first thing I want to establish is that the technical term word is not useful in the context of establishing form meaning relationships. So let's break this down into two subclaims. First, a phonological word is not suited to serve as the relevant notion of word. So there's probably such things as phonological words, but phonological words can uh, correspond to composed meanings. That is, they are not themselves irreducible form meaning mappings, but they represent a series of smaller form meaning mappings that are then composed. So for example, in English, the dog is a single phonological word. It can bear only a single uh, primary stress. Uh, if, uh, if you, uh, at least if you're choosing the non-contrastive, uh, which is arguably its own structure, um, but it's worse than that, right? It's not just that the and dog is a composed meaning and it's only one phonological word. Phonological words aren't even necessarily constituents. So this is a very old observation. We have a name for it, right? Politicization. Uh, one of the senses of the term is that you get things like the sky to be gray, uh, which you, know, you have a politicized um, auxiliary, but then if you draw the tree for this, the underlying portion here is not a constituent. Uh, at all. So, okay, so when we say, if we, if we want to use the technical term word as the basis on which to state the set of uh, primitive form meaning relations, it definitely cannot be phonological word. So conceivably there's another option out there, which is the orthographic word, right? On that view, the dog is two units. So. We don't have the problem that the dog uh, raised for us earlier. So there certainly are such things as orthographic words, at least sometimes, but there's some problems with basing uh, our theory of form meaning mappings on the orthographic word. So this individual pictured here speaks English, but doesn't know how to read or write. Uh, would 
the theory that bases form meaning correspondences on the notion of word be comfortable saying that this individual doesn't know words or worse, that this individual does not know units of form meaning correspondence. And if so, how is the fact that this individual speaks English even possible? Many writing systems, including early Latin and Greek, uh, lacked spaces altogether, or rather those scripts were often written without spaces altogether. Uh, the question is, um, were there no words in early Latin and Greek? So this is a, a style of writing called uh, scriptio continuum. Furthermore, the writing systems for some other language, like take Vietnamese, for example, um, has spaces, but those spaces individuate roughly syllable-sized units. And as Neuer has shown in his uh, 98 paper on Vietnamese, those units are smaller than anything that could be realistically called word insofar as what you're interested in is the minimal units of form meaning mapping. And finally, of course, not every natural language even has a writing system. And those are not no less languages in the sense that we're interested in here. So it seems that orthographic word is not the right notion of word for us to be working with either. Now, at this juncture, if you've heard talks like this before, uh, one typically then launches a final attack on any uh, remaining intuitive notion of word just to make sure the issue is good and settled. So you will see things pointed out like, look, uh, chew the fat is more than one intuitive word, but it uh, still has a single listed meaning. So the word can't be the locus of the form meaning matching. Uh, believable is just one word intuitively, but there's no need to list the meaning of believable. You can entirely predict it from believe and able. And then sometimes it's you know just right, like, uh, like uh, you know, Goldilocks story. Like terrific happens to be exactly like it doesn't mean what you expect from terrify plus ick. Like having the capacity to terrify means something else. So this happens to be the right sized unit, uh, but that's just one of these three cases has that property. Um, and similarly for relations to form. So in the case of went, listing the word as the locus of form meaning correspondence is not the right granularity because both went and go are different forms of the same word, question mark. And thus you can't take the word to be a form meaning correspondence. Uh, ownership is in a sense too big to list as a word since it has no form properties that are not fully predictable from the form properties of owner and ship. And then cat is just right. Uh, it has uh, it has a form that is not predictable from the forms of its parts, but it doesn't have any kind of the fancy go went stuff going on. So, you know, we could go on like this for a long time and some people do and uh, to uh, show that the, even your intuitive remaining sense of word is not a firm basis on which to build a rigorous theory of linguistic competence. But over the years, I've come to believe that this, is, that this last move is completely unnecessary. <laughs> Plainly put, in science, we don't need to spend energy refuting intuitive nebulous proto-theories that are based on folk scientific ideas like wordhood. Instead, the way it's supposed to work is unless and until someone gives us an explicit, non-phonological, non-orthographic definition of word that is not post hoc, that is a definition that is predictive so that we as linguists can use it, but also the child can use it. So this is an important part. Until someone does this, we can just finish the discussion here of this uh, wordhood as the basis for the form meaning relation idea. So I'm gonna consider that matter settled <laughs> from here on out. Okay, so words are the wrong sized unit, uh, maybe morphological exponents, so individual morpheme forms uh, are the right unit of form meaning mapping. So this bullet point says, nope, that's not gonna work either. So let's see why that's not gonna work. And again, a lot of this is not new. 
uh, though some of the framing is, but we'll get to some data that I believe hasn't been adequately discussed to date uh, later in the talk. So, okay, so some, let's start really simple. Uh, just like chew the fat, uh, I should have said this before, chew the fat is an idiom that means to talk at length, uh, to discuss something at length with someone. Uh, it's an English idiom, sorry. Uh, I now realize I completely uh, neglected to point that out when I was looking at this slide. So I will rewind and just repeat this part. The reason chew the fat is a bad, it shows that words are a bad basis on which to build for meaning correspondence is because this means to talk at length with someone, but it's a property not of any of the single words here, it's a property of the whole. And so word, words cannot serve as the ultimate basis for form meaning correspondence. And just like that's true for words, the same is true for individual morphemes because after all, this is also more than one morpheme. And so the same uh, logic applies here. This also requires an X meaning mapping where the X can be bigger than the morphological element, just like it requires an X meaning mapping where the X can be bigger than. And for that matter, so does terrific um, require larger than individual morphological exponents because this is a morphological exponent or maybe it's a few, but it's a morphological unit and this is a morphological unit, but this that is clearly decomposable from a morphological perspective, nevertheless has a non-decomposed meaning. It doesn't mean having the capacity to terrify, it means its own thing. It's very much idiomatic, just like chew the fat is. Further problems are raised by suppletion. So here's our friend Go Went again. If words are the individual units of form meaning mapping, Humboldt's finite means, what are we supposed to put on the form side of the go went entry? Um, there, uh, there is this claim in the literature that things like this are restricted. Uh, so suppletion is restricted to the functional vocabulary of the language on the thought that go is such a semantically bleached verb that it's almost a functional item at this point. Turns out that, that claim does not stand up to uh, cross-linguistic scru uh, scrutiny. So um, as uh, is uh, well known in some circles, uh, Algonquian languages such as uh, Anishinaabemowin um, have uh, an animacy. It's really a gender uh, system or a noun class system where the guiding heuristic semantics are related to animacy. But like all noun class systems, there are things that don't quite fit. And so uh, raspberries are uh, a member of the quote unquote animate class and blueberries are members of the quote unquote inanimate class. And what's relevant for our purposes is that the verb to eat shows a form alternation that you'll have to trust me is not predictable in any way from the morphophonology of Anishinaabemowin and it's just like go went except if you're also gonna claim that eat is a functional rather than lexical item, arguably you've now emptied the term functional of any useful content whatsoever. So the problem raised by this is very much the same problem. That is, if you want to state this as a form meaning correspondence, what, do you, uh, what are you gonna to have to say about the form? Then there are also cases of forms that don't have meaning. Um, and so uh, here I'm building on, uh, not for the first time in this talk, I should say, <laughs> I'm building on uh, observations by Heidi Harley. Um, so there's this uh, mini paradigm of complete completion, but compete can't be turned into a uh, nominal by saying competition. And the idea is that this is such a uh, near minimal pair here that you'd be hard pressed to find a phonological, a purely phonological explanation that generalizes to the phonology of English for why this form is bad, but this form is good. Uh, the way we end up saying this is competition. Okay, so far so good, but what's this extra t or it part, depending on how do you want, you want to precisely morphologically segment competition. In particular, if individual pieces, identifiable pieces of morphology are the units of the mapping to meaning, 
What does t mean? Now there's a temptation to say, this is just morphology and maybe I can have a uh, super segmental or otherwise uh, more enriched phonological representations um, such that this would follow from phonology of the items. It's just that the phonology of the items isn't a string. It's something uh, more complicated. And therefore I'm tricking myself into thinking that this is not predictable from the phonology because my phonology is too simplistic. So that's a logically possible move. The problem I would say is that you're going to start bringing into your quote unquote phonological theory, a heck of a lot of stuff that looks like syntax. So in particular, I don't see a difference in kind between the t in competition and the kahoot in in cahoots, which is uh, an English expression meaning um, to be in a conspiracy with someone, except kahoot on its own is, seems to not have meaning. It's certainly not usable, except in the context of this prepositional phrase with a plural head noun. Short shrift means to give someone less than they are due. Again, shrift, this item doesn't seem usable outside of this expression, doesn't seem to have a life, certainly not a meaning outside of this expression. And similarly for the spick and spick and span, which is an expression meaning very, very clean. Okay, so sort of reducing this to the phonology risks making your phonology have to explain why a whole conjunct was sprouted here, which is probably not a thing you want your phonology to do. Okay, so I will take it uh, at this stage that we have shown that neither word in any existing proposed sense or morphological exponent are suited to be the units of the form meaning mapping. Before moving on, I wanna pause for a uh, methodological note and this is sort of, uh, oriented towards my semanticist colleagues. Um, my discussion of meaning so far has been uh, mostly, maybe entirely uh, about open class items. And it's a feature of a lot of semantics, at least within um, the world that you could broadly characterize as formal linguistics, that it focuses on closed class items. So the question I wanna briefly address is, is this a problem? That is, are, uh, the conclusions here undermined by the fact that I'm talking about the meaning of the quote unquote wrong kinds of items that like to, to really have hefty semantic conclusions, you have to say something about these. So I think it's worth reminding ourselves um, why contemporary formal semantics focuses mostly on closed class items. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a choice that is driven by some in principle idea about closed class items. Instead, it's a heuristic and it's driven by the following thought and for what it's worth um, strikes me as a reasonable thought, not that my opinion necessarily matters. The thought is, look, um, we think that open class items like dog and beauty uh, will compose and, and end up meaning things in much the same way that closed class items like every and the will end up meaning things. However, we have a much better guess on what something like every might mean from let's say predicate calculus than we have about what beauty might mean. I think this is fairly intuitive. Like even if you think it's within the grasp of scientific inquiry to find out one day what beauty means and some people deny that it's within the grasp of scientific inquiry, it's clearly a more complicated task probably than finding the individual meaning of every. So this is the guess but it's a heuristic choice. It's a choice of opportunity. So by parity of reasoning, if it turns out that we are able to learn something about the interpretation uh, and meaning of natural language items by looking at open class items, then unless you're uh, sort of methodologically hypocritical, it must be the case that we should then take those conclusions to be general as well and apply equally to open class items and closed class items because the very same methodological principle underlies the normal focus on closed class items. All right. So with that in mind, I think we can indeed uh, take 
our conclusions so far to be relatively general in this respect and move on to what I consider to be um, the key data that will get us to the proposal that I've already hinted at at the beginning when I was giving you the preview, uh, the highlights. So there are, uh, are expressions like um, go off. Uh, these have uh, various descriptive names. People sometimes call these phrasal verbs or particle verbs. Um, the, my only point uh, that I wanna make here is that this is a combination of the expression go and the expression off in a way that ends up meaning something that you couldn't predict from those parts. So it means something like to be triggered or to explode. Um, English speakers that I've talked to sometimes have an intuition that this is not um, idiosyncratic, that there's some relation to the parts. Um, I wanna say that I think those intuitions are post hoc. That is the, if you meet someone trying to learn English in their adulthood, you'll find that they struggle mightily <laughs> with predicting what these will mean or alternatively given one of these predicting what the particle is going to be. So I'm going to take this to be every bit as idiomatic as kick the bucket or chew the fat. Independently of this, one of the items that enter into this expression participates in this relation, which we've uh, said before, uh, the, the technical term for this is suppletion where you get in two different morphosyntactic contexts, you get two different forms that cannot be related to each other via the productive phonology of English in any obvious way. Now the key data, as far as I'm concerned to where we're going is the fact that expressions like this can be sort of uh, juxtaposed with suppletion like this to give you things like went off, which perhaps predictively means the past tense of explode or be triggered. Now let's think for a minute what the relevant mappings of syntax form and meaning are in an expression like went off. So to reason about this, we're going to have to identify at a minimum which syntactic elements are even involved. Um, so I'm gonna assume a very minimal set of syntactic elements, though the story won't change if you assume uh, a slightly richer inventory. Um, there's some syntactic element that I will call past, which depending on your theory might be the head T or info or aux, something bearing past features. There's a syntactic element go, by which I just mean whatever it is in the syntactic representation that distinguishes go from run, from dance and so forth and an element off in the syntax, which is again, whatever your theory of syntax says, distinguishes the preposition particle off from on, up, in, and so forth. So I think we can all agree that at a minimum, these elements are involved in the expression went off. Well, if that's so, here's how these elements have to be mapped to form and to meaning. On the form side, the presence of past and the presence of go are both causally implicated in the fact that the form ends up being went. Whereas it doesn't seem like much except the particle off is involved causally in the fact that the form ends up being off. Over on the meaning side, however, things align rather differently. In particular, go and off are both causally involved in us being able to get the meaning of triggering or exploding. Whereas the contribution of past in went off is actually the exact same as the contribution of past in went to the store or went home, right? It just contributes the meaning, which I've paraphrased here informally as the reference time is earlier than the utterance time. To put this another way, there's no allosomy, there's no unexpected meaning contribution of the past tense. Now, imagine you're uh, Ferdinand de Saussure and you think uh, language pairs, uh, uh, language involves signs that pair uh, meanings with arbitrary forms. 
Well, let's start with a meaning here. What meaning is paired, sorry, what form is paired exactly with the meaning reference times before utterance time among the forms listed here? Well, the answer is none of them because this does not express past alone. And so there's no unit of form corresponding to this unit of meaning, nor is there a single unit of form corresponding to this unit of meaning. Because if you start here, you're not gonna find one thing here that corresponds exactly to this unit of meaning. That is, and that is the same if you wanna start from forms and work your way towards the meanings. Now, this is interesting because here's what you don't wanna say. You don't wanna say that the form went off is itself a Saussurian sign because you want to decompose went off. You don't want to end up saying weird things like the meaning relationship between went off and will go off is unrelated to the fact that they both have off in them. You don't want to say things like the meaning relation between went off and went home is not related to the fact that they both have went in them and that's past. But so, so clearly there are, this is a composed element. Otherwise, you're going to end up listing a bunch of redundant things in the lexicon if you're going to list each of these as its own expression. But there don't seem to be individual form meaning mappings of the kind that the traditional theory would have us uh, subscribe to. As you might expect, there's nothing English specific about this phenomenon. So Polish uh, has uh, an idiom that means that is uh, means to pull yourself together to uh, to become composed, um, but is literally take yourself in your hand or in your fist. Now, much like the verb go in English, the verb take in Polish participates in unpredictable suppletion based on, in this case, aspect, not tense. So to put this in the uh, terms of our diagrams now, perfective and take contribute non-compositionally, sort of a PF idiom, if you will, to an unpredictable form for this verb. Whereas the reflexive uh, particle is mapped on as you would expect, the preposition is mapped as you would expect, and handful is mapped as you would expect. Over on the meaning side, the idiom is clearly take reflexive take in handful, and that ends up meaning compose yourself or what, or uh, pull yourself together. And the meaning contribution of perfective, even in this case where there's no isolable form of perfectivity, it just changes this to this, the meaning contribution of perfective is exactly the same as it is in cases where the mapping to form is transparent. That is perfective here doesn't mean something different than what, what perfective means in every other perfective sentence of Polish. So this is a lot like the English example. So let's look at an example that's a little uh, farther away in terms of its structure. So German has an idiom that is literally to stand on a good foot with someone, uh, but the idiomatic meaning is to get along with them or to, to, to uh, interact well or uh, amicably. And you may or may not be surprised to learn that the idiom can be used in the comparative, by which I mean you can say, if you want to say we got along better in the past than we do today, you can say we stood back then on a better foot than today. But much like in the English that I just pronounced, uh, and not coincidentally in German, um, comparative good is not gooder. That is to say, yes, there is this ER form, which is what you might expect from the comparative uh, morphosyntax, but the comparative is also causally implicated in, together with good, giving rise to the form unit that is annotated here as F5, which is a non-predictable combination of good and the presence of a comparison. So in terms of form, these are the units, but then what this ends up meaning is literally the comparative of the idiom. That is 
we got along back then to a degree that is higher than some contextually salient standard of comparison, which, surprise, surprise, is exactly what comparative always means in, in this, when used in this manner. Okay, so again, you get this like cross cutting, you can't build a firewall, so to speak, between the different units of form and the different units of meaning, you get this, this crossing. Okay, so now I've shown you uh, a lot of negative results, so to speak, why uh, words are not a good basis to build your form meaning correspondence and morphological exponents are not a good basis on which to build your uh, four meaning correspondence. And then I showed you this kind of went off data of which this is also an example. And this I think steers us towards what a positive proposal might look like. And so a positive proposal would say, um, and this is borrowing heavily from the three lists model of the distributed morphology, but as you will see, it's, it's different in some crucial ways. The listed knowledge of a speaker of a given language consists in at least three things. There's a set of fully abstract syntactic atoms. We can write them in all caps as long as we remember that this is not a form and this is not a meaning, okay? There are then many to one rules I, as I threatened, here's this drawing again. Pardon me, you have not seen it for the last time. There are many to one rules that would map these multiple units of, uh, multiple syntactic terminals, sorry, into units of form and entirely separate. So this is a list of rules. And then there's a separate list of separate rules that map from syntactic terminals to units of meaning. Now, the fact that these are separate is what allows you to have expressions that look like this, where the fact that there's a meaning rule that maps from these two onto a meaning doesn't mean that over on the form side, the rules will group terminals in the same way. These are objects from an entirely different list of rules. And that list of rules has a rule from past and go to went and a rule from off to off. And so these things don't even have to align. And that is schematically what you see in this diagram as well. Um, there's a uh, nota bene here about contiguity. So um, if you are up to speed with literature on allomorphy and uh, also separate from that literature on idiomaticity, you know that one thing that we think doesn't happen is that pairs of nodes that are arbitrarily far away from each other can enter into non-compositional uh, meaning relations, ignoring everything in between. Or similarly, uh, allomorphy, certainly suppletive allomorphy, cannot be triggered at arbitrary distance. So there's a sense in which, uh, in order to it in one of these many to one mappings, the nodes that the rule, that the mapping rule grabs have to be contiguous, have to be next to each other. Now, it turns out that the, the precise formulation of what next to each other means is A, not completely trivial. Uh, the, the respective literatures that I talked about still disagree on that. And furthermore, I see no reason why it has to be the same, the same notion of con contiguity at PF and at LF. And I think there's some evidence suggesting that what it means to be next to each other at PF and what it means to be next to each other at LF can mismatch uh, itself, but that's, that would take us too far afield. And I've been talking for 40 odd minutes. So I will just box this and you can feel free to ask me about it in the discussion period uh, to this talk or separate, separately. Okay, um, one thing that you might be asking yourself at this juncture is, um, I know what it means like, what it means for the child to learn a word in the model that I thought we were going to use back when I was a happy lexicalist, that there are words, they have forms, they have meanings. I have some ideas on how children can learn words. To the extent that any of what I've told you so far has convinced you, you should be experiencing a slight panic inside because I've just shown you that at least when you wanna model the competence of an adult speaker, this isn't a thing. Words aren't units of form meaning syntax mapping. And so what is lexical equity supposed to look like given this model? 
what does it mean to learn table or to learn table or to learn however, what, whatever learning table now amounts to in the proposed architecture. So let's talk about that briefly. First, I wanna make the simplifying assumption that a lot of this literature makes uh, that the child has already successfully done morphological segmentation, which is in reality, no small feat. Uh, that is that the incoming speech has already been divided into morphological exponents. So the child has successfully identified, I have heard form one, form two, four, three, form three, looking at this diagram here. I know that I've heard these three units and I even know that I heard them in this order. But given the many to one mappings on both sides of syntax now, that still radically underdetermines the structure or even the structural atoms that you might have heard not to mention the meanings that these atoms could have been associated with. It's a many, uh, uh, there are many degrees of freedom now, much more than in a lexicalist model. So here's an, uh, a finding that's now uh, quite old already from uh, developmental psychology of language. Um, this might be too small to read, uh, it's a study uh, by Brendan Siskind on the uh, role of exposure to isolated words, more on that shortly, in vocabulary development. And what the quote here says, I'll read it out loud, the frequency with which a child hears a word in isolation predicts whether that word will be learned better than the child's total frequency of exposure to that word. To put this in simpler terms, uh, and I'm taking some artistic license here, um, Children seem to over rely on cases where they hear a word, uh, or I would say likely uh, expression with few exponents, maybe as few as one in isolation, as opposed to the general frequency with which they heard that expression. They over rely on these fragment utterances that have only a word in them. Now, why would that be? Well, here's a thought. Suppose I heard this sequence of morphological forms and I wanna reason about what are the mappings that F3 is associated with? Well, look at all the things that I have to now, all, all this, the space of possibilities, how big it is. It could be that F3 is the joint mapping of these three syntactic nodes onto a single morphological exponent. And these three syntactic nodes map onto two units of meaning, either these two map onto this and this one onto this one, or maybe this one maps onto this one and two map onto this one. And that's just if we hold constant that F3 maps onto these three, but that's not the only option. Maybe F3 is the spell out of these two syntactic nodes, which jointly map onto meaning five and all the other permutations that you might envision. So many degrees of freedom. Whereas if, I heard only one morphological exponent. And like I said, the Brenton Siskin paper is about words and I'm making the sort of leap here to the idea is that words are either one or at least very few units of uh, stored form. I still don't know if that single unit of form that I heard is related to one syntactic node or two syntactic nodes or three and whether those three syntactic nodes are two meanings, the two syntactic nodes are two meanings or one meaning or so on and so forth. But here's what I know for sure. This is related to a discrete number of syntactic elements whose bounds, so to speak, are delimited this way and a fixed number of meaning units whose bounds, so to speak, in meaning space are delimited this way. So I gain a lot more information from this in isolation that I could possibly have gained from hearing it in the middle of a speech stream. And that's even if I correctly identified that the same form unit, quote unquote, is present in both speech streams. It still helps me much, much more to hear it in isolation than it does to hear it when it could have interacted with the spell out of adjacent material in this manner. And uh, just as a footnote, uh, Swingley and Humphrey uh, have then uh, sort of subjected this to more sophisticated uh, statistical analysis almost uh, 20 years later. And it turns out that even if you try to peel off from the 
isolated frequency, the, con the main contribution of frequency that is frequent stuff is also more likely to occur um, in isolation frequently. And so you want to sort of uh, isolate the, no pun intended, isolate the uh, uh, individual contribution of these factors, the contribution above and beyond frequency of, of, of occurring in isolation has a, a very statistically significant contribution on, on what they call word load. So this, is, this seems to be quite a robust um, result. So what's the guiding intuition here? Yes, learners are facing, learners can't rely on nice lexicalist assumptions because they're not true. Instead, they know they have to penetrate this multi, many to many to many mapping, and they uh, try to penetrate this complicated system by establishing footholds uh, that are um, that are easiest to establish when you hear single exponent utterances, or maybe utterances consisting of very few exponents. And as a result, you find an over reliance on those kinds of utterances in bootstrapping uh, early vocabulary. Um, there's a relation here that I won't belabor too much uh, to the single item bias familiar for, from developmental trajectories such as the so-called U-shaped uh, trajectory where you start from treating everything as monomorphemic, so to speak. And so you are accurate on fell just like you're accurate on walk, say, and then you learn the rule and over apply it. And then you learn the exception to the rule the relationship between this and what we've been talking about is that there is a strong, the system is initially very tuned towards the idea that every uh, unit you hear is unitary at multiple levels of representation. Because that's the only way to penetrate, so to speak, in, in the learning sense, um, this otherwise system with massive amounts of uh, 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 degrees of freedom. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to address uh, one concern and show you one more kind of data that supports this view. Um, so here's a potential concern. It looks like this. Um, are we uh, engaging in reduction to the worst case based on a handful of unusual examples? Um, to say this another way, yeah, there are some things like go off and went off and go and went in language, but really, um, the people who assumed lexicalism were very smart people. And the reason you can get away with that is because language is to a very close approximation lexicalist. And how much do we want to completely blow up and upend our theory of competence because of these like rare cases? So the first thing I want to note is that I don't think they're also rare at all. So uh, let's take Semitic languages, for example. Um, so Semitic languages have this uh, morphological property where they combine roots consisting of consonants, usually three, but sometimes two and sometimes four, into these templates that have uh, slots for the consonants of the root plus vowels and sometimes consonants of their own. And it's sort of uh, some parts of the literature make a big deal out of the fact that a single root or what certainly looks like a single root in combination with different templates can yield a dazzling array of different meanings. So uh, kabush plus these different templates can run the gamut between pickles and roads and conquest and a lot of other things that seem unrelated. Um, it's important to note, like, it's not impossible to tell a story. Uh, after all, there is a historical one in this case for uh, why these things are related. But the point is that story is one of many possible stories that you could tell uh, for many possible triads that don't exist. And in particular, the child doesn't know the historical way we got to where we are. And this is where for some people, the story ends. Um, well, I shouldn't underline Aronoff. It's not where the story ends for Aronoff, but uh, this is where the story ends for many people because this is considered special. However, I would submit to you that it's actually the case for almost every single root or maybe every single root in Hebrew. So kabash is supposed to contrast with something like chashab, which also combines with various templates. But look, all these meanings are sort of much closer. They all have to do with computation or cognition in some uh, fairly direct way. But it's still the case that each of these meanings 
could have in principle been associate, have been associated with each of these templates. It's not that every meaning could combine with every templates. There are some restrictions like transitivity and unaccusativity, but in this case, it's the case that every permutation of these three meanings could have been a well-formed way to pair this. But of course, that's not real Hebrew. In Hebrew, only these pairings obtain. Now, what are we to make of these? And, and, and there's, this is the normal case, right? Uh, one is supposed to be the exception. Uh, this is how all other roots behave. So there's still, in fact, unpredictable outcomes of combining a root with a template. Now, I want to remind ourselves of two things. Um, every instance of composition that's not exclusively phonological or exclusively semantic is syntactic composition. That is not an assumption. It's the only game in town unless and until someone gives you a working cross-linguistically valid definition of word that is non-phonological and non-orthographic and devices don't hold your breath. So that means that pretty much every open class item in Semitic is a joint mapping from at least two syntactic terminals, the root and the template onto some composite meaning. Okay. And now remember our methodological point about semantics by parity of reasoning, this means that absent evidence to the contrary, we should, we should assume that every single closed class item in Hebrew is also a mapping from at least two terminals to some meaning. Though, whether that's true or not, I don't have, uh, I can't tell you, but that should be our initial, uh, our null hypothesis in this context. So going back to our uh, larger point, the claim that such mappings are rare is at best a language specific claim. There certainly are languages where many to one mappings are not rare at all. And so arguably that's exactly the kind of thing we want to build our architecture to capture. The last thing I wanna say before I conclude is to show you another kind of evidence for the same architecture. Um, of many to one mappings. And it's a kind of evidence that you've seen before, but I wanna highlight a particular uh, aspect of it. So remember these expressions like in cahoots, which means in a conspiracy with, uh, newfangled, which means um, something that has been invented or come on very recently with a tinge of negative judgment <laughs> towards that something. Uh, short shrift, which we already said was giving someone less than their due. Huckleberry, which is well, particular kind of <laughs> very uh, spick and span, which means uh, very, very clean. And all of these contain elements that have no life of their own outside of these expressions. But at the same time, we, so, I mean, there's a temptation to say these are frozen expressions, but okay, but what about them is exactly as frozen? Their syntax is certainly not arbitrary. So it's certainly not an accident that in cahoots is in cahoots and not skahootin or that the position of the adjective in short shrift is the same position that it would occur in, in a compositional phrase like short film and not shrift short. That is to say, these are entirely regular syntactic structures. The only thing special about them is that they contain elements that don't have their own context-free, if you will, mappings to anything semantically identifiable. Okay. Well, remember our architecture. In particular, remember that how meaning arises in this architecture is via many to one rules from sets of syntactic nodes to units of meaning. Well, if that's how meaning arises, this architecture can represent that readily. It just so happens that the root kahoot participates in no many to one mappings that are any smaller than this. The smallest many to one mapping that Kahoot participates in is the one that includes the preposition, plurality, and so forth. Okay, so to conclude, um, we first established, uh, again, standing on the shoulders of uh, giants here, that there are uh, no words in any meaningful non-phonological, non non-orthographic sense of the term that morphological exponents don't map onto units of meaning uh, as a general matter. 
And then we put forth that instead, the architecture of human language involves these three lists. I've just read them to you, so I won't repeat that right now in the context of the conclusion. But now let's circle back to where we started from in Humboldt and Chomsky and what the secret sauce is for natural language. Notice that none of these things is anything that could have existed outside language. Okay, this is not, even if vervet monkeys have arbitrary signs, they don't, those arbitrary signs, that's not, these are not arbitrary signs of the vervet monkey. In particular, there are elements here that are completely abstract from form and from meaning. There are maps from sets of these to units of forms, and there are separate maps from sets of these to units of meaning. All of this is linguistically proprietary cognitive machinery. And if that's true, then the strong minimalist thesis, the claim that the only linguistically proprietary cognitive machinery is merged is demonstrably false. So I hope that I didn't misspell mucho brigadio. Thanks for your uh, attention. And uh, I think we can uh, start the next uh, phase of this uh, discussion. Mauricio. Thank you, Professor Preminger for the Great and insightful lecture. Now we are going to move forward to our debate with Professor uh, Lesnick. Howard Lesnick is a distinguished professor at University of Maryland, and he is one of the most important collaborators to the generative enterprise with uh, research topics and synthetic theory, learnability, and logical form. Professor Lesnick has already presented a conference at Abralinha ao Vivo. Thus, I would like to thank him for his participation once more. Thank you, Professor Lesnick. The audience is all yours. Thank you very much, Maurizio. Very pleased for this chance to participate in this discussion of this uh, <clears throat> very in intriguing and promising work by my excellent colleague, Amr Preminger. Um, uh, you told me before privately, and you repeated it now, that it's going to be a debate. Um, I don't intend to debate because I think these ideas that we've heard are very promising and uh, likely correct. Uh, so I, instead of debating them, I just want to offer some uh, comments on them and maybe the earlier history of some similar ideas and uh, potential implications. Um, before I do that, something I jotted down during the talk. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, when uh, Omer mentioned this uh, idiomatic phrase, uh, go off or went off, and he said, some people have claimed that it might be compositional, but their explanations are invariably post hoc. I couldn't agree with that more. I'm often uh, uh, really uh, impressed by uh, the meaning of that expression. So consider the following. Um, the alarm was off. That means the alarm was silent. Now consider the expression, the alarm went off. Does that mean the alarm became silent? No, it means the alarm became noisy. I think that's a pretty strong indication that uh, Omer's uh, intuitions about this are correct. Um, okay, um, I have a, a comment and question on what Chomsky <clears throat> in the uh, 1980s started calling the autonomy of syntax. Um, his uh, work from his earliest work was based on a notion of autonomy of syntax, <clears throat> but I haven't been able to find the documentation that he used that exact expression until the 80s. And then within about 10 years, he came to seriously regret he had ever used the term because people dramatically misunderstood what he had in mind. So maybe I'll start by trying to clarify um, what Chomsky had in mind by autonomy of syntax and how it was misunderstood. Um, here's what he didn't mean, that syntax doesn't interact in any way with phonology or semantics. Of course he didn't mean that. In his earliest writings, he claimed that a major criterion of adequacy of a syntactic theory is that it provides representations that can be suitably semantically interpreted. And as far as I know, his view on this uh, hasn't changed over the last 60 years, uh, 70 years. <clears throat> his earlier and later work on phonology crucially had the structured syntactic representation as input to the phonological component. So what did he mean when he talked about autonomy of syntax? 
What he meant was that the primitives of syntactic theory are all syntactic. The syntactic rules are stated in terms of purely syntactic primitives. This obviously imposes heavy constraints on what a grammatical rule can be. And to the extent that it's accurate, pretty great extent, it's well motivated. <clears throat> I think it's of some, uh, oh, now autonomy of syntax, if the strong minimalist thesis were exactly and literally true, that there wouldn't be much more to say because there's just merge. Uh, I think there's more than merge. Omer has given us a good argument that there's more than merge. But I think even internal to the syntactic operations, there's very likely more than just merge, even if merge is just the core. So suppose that's right. And suppose that autonomy still continues to be valid. Autonomy in Chomsky's original sense is somewhat stipulative. Why is it stipulative? The syntactic representations in Chomsky's work, I guess, continues to be true, contained full words with their syntactic properties, of course, but also with their semantic and phonological properties. But the syntactic rules were banned from accessing that information. Am I right, Omer, that under your approach, autonomy of syntax, if it is to have any content at all, is automatic. All there is in a syntactic representation is an arrangement of purely syntactic primes. So that's the first question. So maybe I'll stop there and before I go on to my second question. Omer. Um. Thanks, Howard. Uh, this is all so great. And uh, even though I'm in a, in a department with Howard, as uh, all of you practicing academics know, uh, there's still something special about getting to put some time aside to just hear Howard's thought about my work. We're usually both busy with uh, advising our own students and stuff to, to do this. So this is nevertheless a big privilege. And thanks for the uh, example with the alarm. Now, as to your question, I think the answer is a resounding yes, though I can take no credit for it. So I, I take this to have been the original motivation behind any framework that assumes late insertion, namely uh, a big criterion that was animating certainly early distributed morphology, but it's not the only framework that has this, is these observations that, you know, uh, the set of properties phonological and semantic that uh, syntactic rules can appeal to is if not, null, it's, com it's very restricted, right? Uh, so things like animacy seem to factor in, or some proxies for animacy, I should say, maybe factor into some syntactic rules, but color seems not to, and poisonousness versus edibility seems not to. And so late insertion was a way to do that by what seemed at the time perhaps brute force. However, and I, I do uh, want to uh, wrap this up because I'm interested in hearing Howard's other uh, 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 question. Um, it is very much the case that if um, the architecture, I'm looking for the right slide here, is as I've proposed here, um, which is a late insertion architecture, but it's now insertion for sort of for, for a very fundamental reason, which is that the objects here and here couldn't be shoehorned into an individual syntactic terminal, even if you wanted to try to do so, this now has to follow from, if you will, the very data structure. That is the data structures of that interface syntax with meaning are not the kind of thing that could fit into an individual terminal in the first place. And so then of course, to the extent that rules in syntax make reference to properties that are projected off of individual syntactic terminals, which is another thing that Chomsky has been championing in the in the sense of uh, you know since bare phrase structure, to the sense that in the sense that syntactic properties project from properties of individual syntactic terminals, there will uh, now by definition be no such properties that are directly form or meaning related. Thank you. Um, okay, next. So syntactic primes, which was the theme of your presentation. <clears throat> so a little bit uh, as you know and as some in the audience might know, I'm always interested in the uh, history of these ideas going back to the 50s. <clears throat> so what are the syntactic primes? For Chomsky, <clears throat> until the mid 70s, there were things like noun, verb, et cetera, which were atomic symbols. Your building blocks in some respects seem reminiscent of this. In the mid 70s, 
Chomsky first argued that noun, verb, et cetera, are not atomic, but they're decomposable into binary distinguished, uh, distinctive features. At the time, plus or minus n, plus or minus v. So many people might be thinking, mid-70s, but everyone knows that it was in remarks on nominalization, 1970. Well, everyone says that, yet it's utterly false. Not only isn't it in remarks on nominalization, in fact, uh, I've been challenging colleagues and students uh, for 50 years who tell me it's a remarks on nominalization. Show it to me and I'll give you $10. I've never paid up. Um, so everyone says it's there, it's false. Not only isn't it there, but in that paper, Chomsky explicitly denies the possibility at the time. He says in that paper, remarks on nominalization, quote, it's quite possible that the categories noun, verb, adjective are the reflection of a deeper feature structure, each being a combination of features of a more abstract sort. In this way, the various relations among these categories might be expressible. Yes, yes. For the moment, however, this is hardly clear enough even to be a speculation. You can check it out, it's on page 199. Anyhow, my question is, what's your take on something like such features as uh, sort of more primitive uh, items? Yes. Um, so this is another good question. I, I want to clarify sort of the terms of the discussion before we go any further. Um, that is to say, I am very much adopting, so you saw roots in this uh, presentation, uh, both in the sense that you saw Semitic data involving roots, but also in the sense that you saw syntactic trees that had this kind of form, and then we could uh, informally refer to this as a verb. Yeah, but it's in fact a uh, a structure a structured object even within the syntax, um, and so in that sense, I'm building on distributed morphology. But that is to an extent an orthogonal question, or at least a separable question from the question of whether, let's say, uh, little n and little v, and if there's a little a and a little p, are themselves atomic syntactic terminals that is separate members of list one in the architecture that I'm proposing, or in fact, they are composed, syntactically composed of smaller units of list one. And here I, uh, I'm gonna say something that uh, could be construed as uh, disappointing or could be construed as exciting because there's more research to do. Uh, and that is that I don't quite know. So one thing that we, uh, that has always been a tension between uh, the simplest model of, um, both syntactic listed items and syntactic combination is the manipulation of features on syntactic items. Um, so, you know, you have things in minimalism that say, uh, don't tamper with structure that you've already built, but then if you have any kind of agreement or case assignment relation in narrow syntax, you obviously are tampering with things. We could hide this by saying, no, no, you're not changing the node, you're changing stuff in the brackets underneath the node, but that's a, trick of notation, not of substance. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's fair to say that, and, and, and uh, I, should, I should add one more thing, there are, um, there are approaches like uh, nanosyntax that take this very seriously and say, yes, um, how can multiple different features come to reside on the same syntactic head uh, with, that, that seems to require its own generative engine that puts things together that's not syntax because it's below the level of the head. Let's adopt us being nanosyntacticians, the view that every feature lives on its own separate syntactic head. Even this still doesn't solve the question of the fact that when you, let's say, do person or number agreement, you're changing that one feature that lives on that one head. Mm -hmm. That's a long preamble to say, um, it very well might be that there's just one categorizer. In fact, uh, Alec Morantz and his uh, recent students have been playing around with ideas that are in this general neighborhood and there's just one different categorizer and it's different flavors that we have named noun, verb, adjective, preposition, maybe others are, um, are only uh, epiphenomenal or descriptive labels for particular feature configurations on those individual items. But um, I have to say, I currently don't have anything that will shed on this. The, the architecture that I'm assuming here is compatible, obviously, with both, or at least to the extent that it has allowances for feature manipulation of the kind that would be required for agreement, then it's compatible with both views on the atomicity or non-atomicity of lexical categories. To conclude my remarks, I just wanna thank you for a very stimulating material, extremely well presented.
I do want to make a footnote to that remark. I do want to make one suggestion of exposition. Um, it was very useful to, for you to use the term many to one to describe the way things were put together. But as you well know, because you know probably more mathematics than I do, that's not the sense of many one in math, many to one in mathematics between relations. And, it, and it, when you began, I found it confusing for that reason. <laughs> so if you could find some other term that's sort of as metaphorically clear as many to one, but is not many to one, I think it would help. Thanks again, Howard. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lesnick, and thank you, Professor Preminger, once more for the great, I, I would say debate, but not, but the great conversation. Uh, so uh, I have one question from the audience, and later uh, I have a question on my own. So <laughs> can I start it? Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it uh, correctly, but Stepan Mikalov asked, how would you analyze the German example? Isn't it problematic uh, WRT contiguity as it seems as though the comparative applies to the whole expression semantically while formally it's in the middle most making the form discontiguous? Thank you. Uh, that's a, a, a great question. So thank you also to uh, Stepan uh, who asked it. So let me first uh, reshare the relevant um, slide, so to speak. So uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, the question is about um, in this, I, I, I was talking about this idiom and I was uh, discussing the fact that the, um, this is another example where the units of meaning and the units of form seem to cross cut each other in these ways that are, that are uncomfortable for a strict one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one system. But uh, at some point I said uh, a side remark about uh, things having to be contiguous in order to participate in these mappings from several nodes to one, to, to one thing on the, at the interface. And I take the question to be uh, something like the following, look, um, if stand uh, on one foot, I'm drawing the syntactic representation. So these are neither forms nor meanings, but just syntactic primitives, um, has something like, sorry, not on one foot. <laughs> That's not the idiom. Uh, the idiom is stand on good foot. Uh, with if this is roughly a syntactic structure, then the comparative certainly looks from the morphosyntax of it like it's doing something like this. Well, actually, let's say. But now the elements of the idiom, that is the elements that would have to syntactically compose with the comparative, or even more accurately, the predicate that the comparative morpheme would take as its argument to say this predicate holds back then to a degree that's larger than the degree to which this predicate holds in some contextually salient standard of comparison. That predicate consists of something like this, may, put this in another color, it may or may not be included uh, in that. Um, this certainly doesn't look like the comparative is taking those other elements as a single constituent that is its sister. And in particular, you might be concerned that the, these elements are both not a constituent and they're not even contiguous. So here is where I was saying to, uh, at some point in the middle of the presentation, that it's not clear to me that contiguity at PF and contiguity at LF are even the same thing. So we know that there are certain kinds of allomorphy that require adjacency or seem to require something close to adjacency. But adjacency I take to be uh, the currency of PF. That is the, the, the kind of relational predicate that PF can apply to an input and say, does it hold, does it not hold? 
Um, that kind of adjacency would in fact be a surprising thing to find uh, hold of a, uh, a, a condition that applies at the semantic interface. So what kind of conditions uh, might you find at the semantic interface over which you might build contiguity? Well, here's an idea um, that I've been playing with. And, and so I've, I've been present, what I've been presenting is part of a work in progress that's, well, progressing slowly that I'd, than I'd want, but progressing nonetheless. Um, adjacency is really computable based on precedence. Um, so, you know, uh, A is, uh, precedes and is adjacent to, to B if there's no C such that C precedes B and A precedes C, right? That you can define adjacency from the partial order of precedence. Well, there are partial orders that make PF sense, that make LF sense, just like precedence makes PF sense as a partial order. The partial order that comes to mind is outscopes. Outscopes is a partial order that holds at LF because uh, some pairs of LF objects are definitely ordered by virtue of outscopes and others are unordered. Now, imagine that what it means to be PF, uh, to, sorry, I keep bungling this. I hope I'm not being uh, irredeemably confusing. What it means to be LF adjacent means relative to the partial order that's active at LF, the same thing. That is A and B are M adjacent, where M is a module, could be PF, could be LF, if and only if there doesn't exist a C such that A M precedes C and C M precedes B where M proceed, sorry, some of this might be appearing out of screen because of our faces. So I'll do the same thing that I was doing before, where um, M proceeds is defined as linear precedence at PF and at scoping at LF. This, there's there's a uh, work that's relating to this uh, by uh, Chris Barker and people who replied to Chris Barker about to what extent C command can be interchanged with outscoping at the LF interface. I don't want to wade into that debate because it's it involves things that are uh, logically separable from what I'm saying here. I'm just saying that these ideas that the fundamental currency of LF is outscoping have some research tradition associated with them. And if this is all the case, then it's no longer uh, all that clear to me, at least, that, let me see if I can bring it back now without too much trouble. It's no longer clear to me that the elements of this idiom are, no, are not LF contiguous or not LF adjacent with one another. Now, I'm not saying that this is, LF adjacency uh, 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 defined this way will then be the only constraint on idiomaticity because if you have an entire sentence made of rigid designators that none of them have like scopal uh, 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 potency, you'll end up having like the prediction that one thing all the way over here in the sentence can idiomatically interact with another thing that's all the way on the other side. But at least with respect to whether things are contiguous or not, I suspect that this is going to be the way to go at LF. I hope that uh, addresses at least the essentials of the question. Thank you, Professor. And thank you, Stepan, for the question. Uh, we have another question here from Ned Sanger. Uh, any thoughts about the hard problem of how these meaningless, formless, synthetic atoms evolved? Presumably, we didn't evolve them one by one, just as we didn't evolve each finger one by one. Um, yeah, so uh, here my, my answer is gonna be a, a really underwhelming one. The, the, I think the intellectually honest thing to say is no, I don't have a thought. Um, so th this work can be seen as um, 
This is in fact an adage that Chomsky himself is very fond of saying, which is that in order to ask how X evolved, one first needs a very accurate characterization of X. He usually uh, levels this criticism against theories of language development that have misconstrued the object that develops uh, in the child. Um, but I think in the same vein, we can't ask how human language involve, evolved without an accurate characterization of human language. And my contribution such that it is, is merely to say, look, it's not just merge, it has to include this other thing. So the problem is in a sense harder than we thought it is, but it's better to know that than to not know that. And so uh, the intellectually honest answer to Ned's very good question is, I don't know. Okay, uh, but thank you for the answer. And we have uh, one more question from Luan Tren. Do you have any comment on the construction grammar framework, which also recognized the problem of form meaning pairing? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, this is in fact one of the questions that I uh, sort of suspected that I might get. Um, and that is that the, the, the thing on the right here, on the right hand side here, uh, looks a heck of a lot like things that you might find in certain variations of construction grammar and also in Akendoff's uh, uh, parallel architecture, you might find uh, things that are, if not, if not like this, they definitely uh, bear, oops, I'm sorry. They definitely bear a strong resemblance to things like this. And so the question is, uh, how, are, how is the framework that I'm sketching here materially different from those other frameworks? And my answer is that the syntax that this is built atop is every bit the, uh, the generative syntactic model that we're all familiar with. The only claim is that the uh, individual units that that framework manipulates are much more abstract than it's usually thought when we write uh, phonological stuff at the bottom of the nodes or lambda expressions at the bottom of the nodes or what have you. That is, within this architecture, the syntactic, the endeavor of syntactic theorizing is very much as it was. Um, in particular, um, the hope of having an explanatory handle on why uh, things like uh, quote unquote constructions like WH movement and topicalization and relativization all have the common properties that they have as opposed to a situation where relativization would have a set of properties that's much, that's completely different from WH movement, that's completely different from topicalization, which a construction grammar framework it could readily handle, but a, a generative syntactic framework uh, is less equipped to handle, those things remain as they were. And so this allows us, uh, this framework that I'm sketching here allows us to capture some of these uh, uh, many to one effects with the, apologies to Howard, his point is well taken, to capture some of these many to one effects without throwing out the explanatory baby with the bathwater. That would be my uh, reaction to that. Okay, thank you for the question and for the answer. We have uh, one last question from Mal Shah. I guess uh, it pronounces like this. Do you think that the rules mapping to SAM are still highly constrained in important ways, even if they are more loose than lexicalist views of the meaning side? Um, I certainly hope so, <laughs> because, um, look, I, I talked a little bit about how uh, this model makes the learning problem harder and how we might find hints in some data from language acquisition that the particular kind of difficulty that this predicts is actually there, uh, at least when viewed through the prism of how it's circumvented, that is over-reliance on, isol uh, on isolated utterances. Nevertheless, if the set of things sitting on the other side of the syntax meaning mapping, that is the meaning side of the syntax meaning mapping are entirely unconstrained. Uh, 
clearly the problem explodes. And there's some work suggesting, um, I'm thinking of, of uh, Bob, uh, Jonathan Bobolik's 2012 um, monograph, which uh, I'll try to summarize, <laughs> an impossible task of summarizing in a sentence. He shows that um, uh, there is good morphosyntactic evidence to think that the superlative, as in uh, the tallest is, uh, the est part of tallest is built upon the er comparative of taller uh, in, in a morphosyntactic sense, not just in uh, other senses. And he points out that this is a contingent fact. It didn't have to be that way. It was, it's possible to directly specify the meaning of the superlative in the superlative morpheme without making any reference to the comparative morpheme. So why does it seem to be a cross linguistic fact that that's not how the superlative is structured? And his speculation is that this is something about the amount of semantics you can pack on, you can pack into one listed semantic meaning. That is a single, like what's on the other side of these lookup rules? Like these nodes map onto this listed meaning. Let's call this a, a semantic entry. The amount of semantic substance that you can pack on into a single semantic entry is somehow limited, or at least people strive to keep it low. Um, there's an epistemological problem for us as researchers which, with all this, which is that um, we have more direct uh, epistemic access to what forms are. That's not to say that, the, that all the problems in phonology have been solved and everybody knows, uh, agrees on everything, but I think uh, every uh, semanticist, uh, uh, if, if they, were, if they uh, were being asked and are, are being intellectually honest, would readily concede that we have, that our uh, evidentiary access to meanings is even more indirect. And so um, I think it, it's fair to say that at the present, we have less to say about that, but um, in the totality of, of, of sort of cognitive science, it better end up being the case that the meanings are restricted somehow. Otherwise the, the learning uh, problem seems to, to, to border on intractable. Yay, Professor Preminger, thank you again for the answer. So uh, I guess because of the time, we are getting into the end of this panel. So once more, I would like to thank very much both Professor Preminger and Professor Lesnick for the insightful and amazing conversation and also the audience for the attendance and the questions. Uh, would you like professors to make some concluding remarks? Um, for my part, uh, I just wanna thank everybody. These questions were great even when, or even maybe especially when I have no answer. <laughs> it's, <because laughs> it's a hard question and food for thought. So I really appreciate getting uh, questions, both the ones that I feel I can answer and both the ones that I at present cannot. And in any event, the questions show that people were really listening. And so I, I owe you a debt of gratitude for your attention. Uh, so thanks. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Autonomy of syntax is something that's always interested me. And uh, I'm very intrigued by this particular take on it. <laughs> So thank you on behalf of Abrelin and on my own. So uh, everyone, uh, I guess this is all for today. And please do not forget to follow the next panels from Abrelin Viv. And thank you all for everything. This is it.